Please stand as you are able for today's scripture reading. The scripture is from the book of Romans, chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. But in our time, something new has been added. What Moses and the prophets witnessed to all those years has happened. The God setting things right that we read about has become Jesus setting things right for us. Not only for us, but for everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we have compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. God sacrificed Jesus on an altar of the world to clear that world of sin. Having faith in him sets us in the clear. God decided on this course of action in full view of the public to set the world in the clear with himself with himself through the sacrifice of Jesus, finally taking care of the sins he had so patiently endured. This, not, this is not only clear, but it's now. This is the current history. God sets things right. He also makes it possible for us to live in his righteousness. So where does this leave our proud Jewish insider claims and counterclaims? Canceled? Yes, canceled. What we've learned is this. God does not respond to what we do. We respond to what God does. We've finally figured it out. Our lives are our lives get in step with God and all others by letting him set the pace, not by proudly or anxiously trying to run the parade. And where does that leave our proud Jewish claim of having a corner on God? Also canceled. God is the God of outsider non-Jews as well as insider Jews. How could it be otherwise since there is only one God? God sets right all who welcomed his action and enter into it. Both those who follow our religious system and those who have never heard of our religion. But by shifting our focus from what we do to what God does, don't we cancel out all our careful keeping of the rules and ways God commanded? Not at all. What happens, in fact, is that by putting that entire way of life in its proper place, we confirm it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be. call your attention to the sermon notes found in your bulletin insert. These are the notes that I sketched uh, during the week and you may add to these notes, your notes, your drawings uh, of this sermon. So the Christian church has entered into a surreal environment and at some point I don't, I feel like the Christian church doesn't know what to do. We don't know how to be the church that God envisioned us to be. 
I mean, we, we live in a world that is post everything. Uh, post disco music. <laughs> post Barry Manilow. I mean, just uh, post uh, modernism. Post 9 11. Post truth. Post Christian. Post pandemic. I mean, you can add all kinds of adjectives or adverbs after the word post. Because that's the kind of world we live. It's a different place from what it was just a few years ago, or a few decades ago. ago. And this, this post-everything world is, is more divisive, more political, more polarized. Uh, it's certainly more difficult to live in than ever before. Uh, these, these realities are not just being felt in society, but also inside the church. And, and, and so the question for us is, what do we do as a church? Do we compromise our values? Uh, do we allow the, the secular influence to, to shape who we are and what we do? Uh, do? Do we enter into a conversation to make compromises and adaptations? Or, or do we still f uh, stay faithful to our ageless faith and, and, and stay grounded on the values and beliefs that we have uh, seen and we have adopted and, and embraced? Because those values and those beliefs have endured all kinds of enemies throughout the ages. So the clear answer for me is that we need to stay faithful and stand strong, anchor in the, in the strength of our faith that is ageless. And this decision, however, produces another dilemma. Because in a world like this, where everything is evolving rapidly and, and changes are happening at every corner of our society, we, we need to find as a church a way to, to adapt a little bit to, to what's going on uh, around us. Uh, we're going to struggle if we're not being real and relevant to those who no longer see the church as the most important thing in their lives. So I believe that the gospel message must always stay the same. But the way we deliver that message may need to be adapted to the cultural and the historical uh, environment of, of, of the context we live in. And so yes, the message stays the same, but then we need to adapt a little bit to the way we deliver that message. Uh, to me, what makes it even more difficult for the church uh, to navigate these challenging dynamics is, is the kind of mindset that we allow ourselves to have as a church. Uh, many churches feel like they're just surviving uh, they're, they're just keeping themselves afloat, and they, they don't want to close their doors because uh, the, the, the only thing they know is, is to, to be that, that small group, and, but they don't want to reach out to anyone else. And so when that happens, then there's this sense of anxiety of what's going to happen with us. There's this sense of nostalgia, and then this idea starts starts uh, growing in, in people's minds and hearts. The idea is that the best course of action for a church is to find a way back to the way we used to be. And that idea is impossible in today's, day, in today's world. Because it's a different world. It's a challenging present. It's a, it's a world that has changed all the assumptions of the church. So uh, when all they see in front of them is a very uncertain future. It's a very challenging future. So, so the default is to, to start swimming back to, to the glory days and, and to find a way back. But as they are swimming back, it, it's, an, uh, it, it's an effort that is not going to take them anywhere because we cannot go back to the glory days. And so we feel like we're stuck. We see our future very uncertain. We live in a world presently that is difficult. We cannot go back to the, to the back. So, so what are we going to do? We feel stuck as a church. But instead, beloved, I, I, I think and I believe that in a world like this, God is calling his church to renew our mindsets. He's calling us to change the, the spiritual chip that we have in our hearts. He's calling us to, uh, to believe that the church is really not dead. Because it's, the church is a divine enterprise. 
It's not the invention of, of humans. The church is a God thing. And, and because it's a divine enterprise, it is not dead. Uh, the, the church has been vaccinated with the power of the resurrection of Christ. And because of that, uh, we, we have access to that power so that the church can thrive again. Jesus never said that he might build a church only if the conditions are ideal and favorable. Or he might build his church only if he finds the real or the, the right leaders and puts them into place. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said that he would build a church that nothing and no one can or will ever overpower and overcome or prevail against it. Not even hell can prevail against the church. And, and the faith of the church is built on a strong cornerstone. And, and for that reason, we can thrive as a church, even in the most hostile environments and the most unfavorable conditions. The church is not stuck. The church is not dead because it is a divine enterprise. And we are part of that church. We need to change our mindset. And the reason why the Christian church can thrive is because of the object of our ageless faith. And that object is the righteousness of God. Now, this is what a post-Christian world proposes to us. That all truth is relative or subjective. And that we Christians often respond to that idea, uh, not knowing what to do, but then we need to insist that there are absolutes in this world. This is what we call absolute objectivism, which means believing that all truths are objective. Just like absolute relativism must, m means believing that all truths are relative. Objective truths do not depend on the situation, the context, the culture, the interpretation, or anything else. They exist on their own and are true even if no one believes in them. For example, it is an objective truth that my wife's name is Hilda and that my daughter's name is Lisette, and that she has a beautiful daughter, my granddaughter, whose name is Olivia. I mean, whether you believe that or not, I believe they're beautiful, and, and those are their names. And, and so it is that the, the sun is, is shining all the time. And so it is that the, the, the earth is round. I mean, whether you feel like they're not, that's irrelevant. Whether you believe or, that, or not that the, the, the sun is shining all the time or the, the earth is round, uh, that is irrelevant. They are. It's an absolute truth. And, and, and we believe that uh, uh, objective truths are important in our, in our belief system. So as Christians, we strongly affirm the existence of objective truths because these are foundational to our faith. It is because of the objective truth that God created us that we exist. It is because the objective truth that the righteousness of God, that we can have the access to, to a life that is meaningful here on earth and a life that is eternal there in heaven. And I believe that in these matters of faith, there is no room for relativism. I must say that here, I must say here that if your faith is disconnected from God, if your faith is disconnected from Jesus, it may become a subjective exercise of personal, personal preference. But as long as your faith is connected to the righteousness of God, it will endure from generation to generation because it is objective in nature. So now let me share with you about the righteousness of God according to the scripture. We read this morning from Romans chapter 3, verse 25, that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. And what is righteousness, you, you ask? So God's righteousness comes from his most overpowering desire to bring people into the, a right relationship with him. You know, God longs to, uh, to claim his place in our hearts, to be our companion, to be our sustainer, to be our friend, to be part of our lives. He, he longs to have that opportunity in your life. 
And so he desires for us to develop this right relationship with him and to avoid having a wrong relationship with him. Now, here are some evidences of how a wrong relationship with God shows up in our lives. If you find yourself hardly praying or worshiping, it may mean your connection with God is a little bit weak. Ignoring the Bible or not seeking God's guidance can also be a sign of persisting in sinful behavior without feeling the need to repent and to ask forgiveness points at a very cold heart towards God. You might also notice a lack of spiritual growth, feeling stuck, or even moving backwards in your faith, and and missing the joy and the peace that usually comes from a, a close relationship with God can be another indication. Struggling with relationships, being self-centered, disobeying God's commands, and feeling indifferent towards, towards church or, or towards, towards serving other people and, and, and becoming a, 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 an agent of change in society uh, may also be a, a sign of, of being in the wrong part of that column. A general lack of enthusiasm or, or interest in spiritual matters points to a disrupted and certainly a wrong relationship with God. Now, I'm not going to ask you to take a test, (laughs) because I believe all of us fall under one of those categories. All of us sometimes have visited the wrong side of the relationship with God. And all of us have the desire to be on the right relationship with God. And and for that to happen, God used this following method. Uh, He presented Christ as a sacrifice for atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And this is where our ageless faith comes uh, and becomes more powerful because it allows us to, to have and to enter into that relationship with God, into that right relationship with God through the sacrificial uh, pre, uh, atonement of Jesus, through the blood that he shed, we're able to be uh, forgiven and cleansed from our sins. And then we enter into that relationship so that we can stay in that right side of the relationship with God. So Jesus did that for us so that we can enter into that kind of relationship with God. So now that we understand what the object of our faith is, let's get to understand better our ageless faith, which is both temporal and eternal. So this means that uh, our faith really affects our lives here on earth, uh, what we do and how we live uh, in, in the present. Uh, it guides us the, the way we live. It offers us purpose and, and, and love and hope and, and a sense of, uh, of community. It teaches us to love others and to seek justice and to find peace with God and, and, and others. Uh, this, this is the temporal aspect of the faith that gives us strength and direction. Uh, and, and we need that kind of life, uh, faith in our daily lives. At the same time, the Christian faith is eternal because it prepares us to go into our eternal home. It allows us to have a, a, a guiding star, a, a guiding point, uh, so that as we travel in this very difficult world, we're looking at the eternity, uh, hoping to be there one day, with, one day with God, in which we can share with Him in fullness of fellowship. And that's why our faith is both, both temporal and eternal. Our ageless faith is both a root and a fruit. So as a root, it provides this foundation uh, through which we, we are nourished and, and we are supported. It grounds us in God's love and truth. It provides us the strength and the stability we, we need through the challenges of life. Uh, this deep connection with God through faith influences our thoughts, our actions, our decisions, and shapes everything that we have from the inside out. Now, as, as a fruit, faith allows us to, to blossom into beautiful practices of, of, of love and compassion and justice that, that blesses other people. Because the, the, the fruit that we exhibit is not just to look uh, beautiful and to look pretty, but it's actually to be useful in God's kingdom. And so faith allows us to, be, uh, to, to experience being rooted in Christ, but also to experience to be fruitful in Christ. And speaking of uh, impact, our ageless faith is an active catalyst that brings transformation. So let me share with you about the impact of our ageless faith in both the human condition and 
the social community. Beloved, for individuals, I believe that our ageless faith provides the hope and the sense of belonging. It, it helps people navigate life's challenges with strength and resilience. Our ageless faith offers us the spiritual solution to sin and to death and addresses our, our human uh, longing for significance and for purpose. That's the kind of faith we're talking about. And in the social community, this faith promotes values like compassion and, and service to others. It inspires people to engage themselves in acts of kindness on behalf of others. But also, it allows us to become a, a society that is united in the midst of, of, of this community, this society that is so polarized, is so divisive. We need a faith that brings us all together, that allows us to respect each other in spite of our differences, that allows us to work for Christ and to do ministry on behalf of God in spite of our differences. That's how our ageless faith works within us in our social community. So our Christian faith not only impacts the lives of individuals, but also strengthens and improves social and society as well. And finally, we need to understand one of the most important aspects of our ageless faith. There is an ultimate goal that it is pursued by our faith. And this is how it works. This faith turns people into disciples. This faith turns disciples into apostles. So it's a powerful faith. It's something that we need to embrace. People become disciples and they learn about love and kindness and forgiveness. They build a strong relationship with God. Then the goal is to help these disciples become apostles who are not just followers, but they are active messengers of the faith. Remember, apostles are sent out to share the message of Jesus with others, to teach and to serve communities on behalf of Christ. They become leaders to spread the gospel message to all people in all the world and to let people know that their Lord and their Savior wants to enter into a relationship with them. The, this process of making disciples and, and turning them into apostles uh, has ensured the continuity of our ageless faith. Just think about it. We are here today because somebody in the past made a commitment to be a disciple of Jesus and then to become an apostle of Jesus and then to share that ageless faith to the next generation, and then the next generation, and so on and so forth, until we got to this generation, until the faith came to us. But that faith will not stop here, beloved. That faith needs to continue. And, and that is why uh, uh, we need to understand that God has given us this powerful responsibility of becoming disciples and then becoming apostles. Beloved, a pre-Christian world, the likes of what the Christians in Rome experienced in the first century, a post-Christian world like the one we are experiencing now, the mindset of human secular values, the waves uh, of constant opposition to Christianity are no match to the power of our ageless, ageless faith when it is placed in God's righteousness as its object. And it is up to us to make sure that that faith continues from generation to generation. So today the question for us is, would you be a disciple of Jesus? Would you embrace that discipleship? But you, would you be willing then to become an apostle of Christ and to do this on behalf of Christ and share that ageless faith to the generations to come. Think about this question and pray with me. Dear God, today, we pray that your spirit will work through our hearts, through our minds, that we may be your disciples. 
that we may become your apostles, that we may share to those who come before us and in front of us the powerful message of our faith. Prepare us to do this. In your name we pray. Amen.